Hello, hello. There we go. All right. You are tuning into our second live stream interview of CryptoSlate, your original source for compelling news in the crypto space. Today we have Brock Pierce, child actor turned game entrepreneur turned crypto pioneer. Pierce is a purported Bitcoin billionaire and was listed at number nine in Forbes richest people in cryptocurrency. List and has funded dozens of crypto companies, including Coinbase, Coinbase, Ethereum, and Bitfurium. Notably, he's also one of the co-founders of Block One and EOS, chairman of Bitcoin Foundation, and co-founder of Tether. So your reputation precedes you. So first off, I'd like to thank you for taking this interview. Um, so you have a pretty complex timeline here. So why don't you tell us about the highlights and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, we're having a little bit of weird audio, but um, do you hear me fine? Yeah, I hear you fine. Okay. Um, you want to know uh, kind of timeline how I got here, where we are today? Yeah. So, I mean, you have a pretty rich career, including... How far back do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how far back do you want to talk about? <laughs> and I'm happy to go as far back as you like. It's your show. All right. Um, why don't we, I guess, start with... We don't have to go into your child acting career. That's pretty well written about. But why don't we do like post... Um, what is it? Den? So digital okay. entertainment group we can go beyond when you start in um, internet, internet gaming entertainment. Yeah, well, I grew up as a gamer. Um, you know, I played a lot of games as a kid. I was an early what you'd call pro gamer, but this is before the sort of esports industry, you know, had developed. And as a result of that, you know, I was, you know, playing games. Um, and things like Magic the Gathering would have been kind of the precursor to what I did with IGE. I would, uh, you know, um, buy and sell and trade uh, baseball cards, magic cards, etc. And there was a game called Sanctum that came out in 1999. It was from a company called Digital Addiction. Hmm. And it was basically Magic the Gathering online meets chess before Magic the Gathering had gone online. And so it was a collectible card game, you'd buy backs of cards and you'd play on a board. And, you know, you'd, you know, it was a battle sort of game. And I started making a market for those in-game cards. I'd buy and sell and trade with other players in the game. Eventually, I contacted the game company and I said, hey, I'd like to buy your virtual packs of cards in bulk at a discount, just like baseball card shops and comic book stores do. And, uh, and I'd like to be able to sell the singles. And you don't want to be in the business of selling the singles because that would undermine your primary market. You know, in the analog world, the primary market is those that packages the cards and sells the packs. And the secondary market, like the used car sales shops, are, you know, the baseball card stores and the comic book shops. I'd like to do that for you online. And I said, and they're like, well, that's how it works in the analog world. That Sure, that sounds great. That makes sense. And so the business was making like $50,000 a year. And that's about all you could do in that game because it never had more than 5,000 players. Because <laughs> these were the sort of early online games that had um, emerging economies. Fast forward to Ultima Online and then eventually EverQuest. And in those games, these, you know, the first sort of persistent worlds or MMORPGs, I was buying, well, I started out farming or mining the in-game currencies and items and realized that wouldn't scale because I had more demand than I had inventory. And so I'm like, well, how am I going to get more inventory? And I kept trying to find more inventory and find more inventory. And eventually, like, I just could never meet the customer demand. And so I'm like, wow, I'm going to need thousands or tens of thousands of people to play these games professionally to mine currencies just to meet market demands. And so I eventually said, where in the world can I get, you know, where, where could I train a bunch of people to play games to make money? And so I was looking at Latin America, Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe you know, China, India. And I came to the conclusion that China was the ideal place because they had the highest propensity to game, the economy or wages were at the right levels. And um, uh, I moved to Hong Kong, you know, kind of the next day when I came to that conclusion and trained the Chinese market how to play games professionally to mine digital currencies. That resulted in building up a supply chain of about 400,000 people that would play games like World of Warcraft to mine those currencies that I would then sell all over the world. Uh, the company that I started called IGE, we were PayPal's largest merchant for more than three years. We, uh, Project IGE was PayPal's credit card processing division. They built it for us. Um, we were Google's largest advertiser for a little while. 
we launched uh, platforms like Alipay. Mm -hmm. So we rolled up all the world's sort of game currency exchanges and media properties and all the things. I think we d did about maybe $20 billion of sales. And so it was through all that gaming activity that eventually led me to this. I could bore you with, you know, hours of stories about other things I've done. <laughs> yeah, I'm also a big gamer myself, so I can certainly relate to uh, the whole, how this whole world of Twitch and everything else has kind of opened up gaming to the mainstream. And now it's regular people who love the game, not just um, kids sitting in their garages, which is awesome. Yeah. So what, what really led you to buy your first Bitcoin? Because I, I understand that virtual currency does sound like a natural transition, but it, you were pretty early on in, in the scene. So what kind of led to that whole, whole thing? Well, you couldn't buy Bitcoin in the early days. Um, and even by like 2013, it was very hard to buy a meaningful amount of Bitcoin. You know, anybody that was around and call it early 2013 or earlier, I mean, unless they were buying a, making a very small investment, um, buying Bitcoin was very difficult. Mm -hmm. The way that you would accumulate a large position in Bitcoin in the early days was through mining. So I'll tell you one story, which I'm not sure how often I've told it. This is one of the rare uh, <laughs> stories because it's not really that relevant. But um, started making, um, when started making much larger investments into Bitcoin, uh, you had to do this through mining. And so when the first ASIC was being released, the first, you know, super miner, the first supercomputer sort of as a miner mm -hmm. was built by Avalon. And so the first batch of Avalons, the first ASICs ever to hit the market, um, I bought 10% of all the world's batch one Avalons. And so I think I was the largest Bitcoin miner in the world uh, uh, in that moment. So you asked the question about, you know, when did you start buying Bitcoin? The reality is most of us that were early didn't buy Bitcoin. We, we mined it. Were you uh, one of the large, by, by extension, did you go into mining as a, like a full-time investment then kind of running these farms for, for a while? Yeah, I, I've done a bunch of mining stuff. It doesn't really go in the list of things I talk about because it's the kind of the least interesting <laughs> of the things, gotcha. I've done. but I've done a bunch of stuff um, in mining um what are the most interesting things well uh one of the early miners k and c miner um you know if you've been around through the you know today you've got bitmain 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 and bitfury <laughs> um, um but there were a lot of other miners over the years most of which went out of business during the last bear market not this bear market and so uh, k and c miner out of sweden was one of the big new mining companies um i was a large customer of theirs and cut a deal to run KNCMiner.cn. So I was the exclusive distributor for KNC Miner into China. And so I brought a lot of the mining business into China. And so did that for KNC Miner. We were the largest Bitfury customer in the beginning. We bought three reels of their first chips. But we got very, uh, we, we decided we didn't want to stay in that business and we had the right for a refund. And so we asked for a refund for those first three reels. Um, they really needed the money. Um, had we converted that capital into equity, I probably would own a third of Bitfury today because they needed the money that badly. But instead we took the refund, uh, you know, uh, oh well. A um, bunch of other things. We set up the, I think the largest mining operation in the US up in Washington state in 2014. Oh, another business we did was called Zoom Hash. And so we did like $20 million of sales in six months for the, what were called grid seed. These were the, the first big Litecoin miners. Um, and we were the number one store on Shopify that year. Um, my partner, Michael Cow, you know, won the award for top, sh top shop. And so Ariana Huffington, Mark Cuban, Damon John became advisors to that business. That's how they got into crypto. Hmm. I've done a bunch of stuff in mining that I, I like, these are stories I've almost never told anyone. I, I love these stories because I used to run a mining facility in Eastern Washington as well before I came to Crypto Slate. So yeah, we had, why, we had, why don't you touch a little bit on that? I'm cur honestly just curious. Well, so as you start thinking about how you build mining operations, your cost of electricity yes. is your main variable. Um, you know, obviously, you, you have to be able to source the right hardware at the right time and, and uh, take delivery quickly. 
you know, when, when we were in these bull markets, I mean, your hardware was obsolete in, in 90 days. Yeah. So uh, electricity, I mean, if, 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 if your stuff shows up a week late, you know, that like, I mean, that's the difference between profitability and not being profitable, meaning you have to ship that as fast as you can. You know, you, every day matters. Every hour mattered back when the network was um, accelerating at these crazy rates. And so, uh, yeah, you, it didn't matter what the shipping cost was. Get it there as fast as possible. And when it arrives, you don't wait till morning to hook it up. <laughs> you know, it's like you stay up until it's all running. And so uh, once you figure out that component, which is you have to be able to source the right hardware at the right time, install quickly, maintain uptime, let's call that the basics, right? The, the really complicated variable for most miners was your cost of energy. So in the United States, where's the cheapest electricity? And so spent a lot of time, you know, looking all over the country to figure out where the cheapest energy was. And this is before other miners were there. Um, you know, when you're, when you're having to figure this out for the first time, it's hard. <laughs> when once there's a trend of 50 people doing it, it's much easier to figure that out. Um, but we figured out that there were three counties in Washington state where you had energy between two and three cents per kilowatt hour. And so uh, uh, my partner, Michael Cow moved up there and a couple of other people and we set up a 10 megawatt mining facility. I think we're like 20 megawatts up there today. I still, I think, own two and a half or 5% of it, but I, it's like, <laughs> I, I, I've never even once been to the facility, uh, <laughs> wow. which is kind of how important it is to me. Mining is not where I, I, I focus, um, so but I was very active in the, uh, in the mining business for a while. Gotcha. So it's more. Oh, and then, oh uh, one really cool story, Go ahead. which is kind of how Block One and EOS got started. Um, so Brendan Bloomer, the CEO of Block One, was in the games business. He was buying and selling World of Warcraft accounts and things like that when he was 15, 16, 17. So I bought his company when he was 18 and then told him, don't go to college, skip your scholarship to Stanford, move to Hong Kong, come work for me. And that's how block one ended up in Hong Kong. So Brendan was out in LA with me in like 2014 and went, oh my God, I got to get into this business. I got to get into this business. We hang out for whatever. He goes back to Hong Kong. He's like, I'm going to sell everything. And, you know, I'm coming to work with you. Uh, then you get caught up in kind of the routine. He had some very successful businesses doing big things and kind of that fizzled out. Fast forward, so I've been a teacher at the Singularity University for a number of years. And so I was on my way to India to teach uh, at a Singular Singularity University course and Brendan had offices between Hong, Hong Kong and, uh, and India. And so Brendan's like, okay, I'm gonna be in India the whole time you're there. I'm gonna drive you around and take care of you. I just can't wait to hang out for a few days. But the day before I flew to India was very interesting. I was in Amsterdam for one night or two nights. I think teaching at another singularity class. Um, I think that's why I was there. But um, for Deloitte, that or it was someone else, but <laughs> it's been a while. But I had dinner uh, and, and spent the night uh, before with Gavin Wood, uh, Dr. Gavin Wood, who wrote the yellow paper for Ethereum, um, you know, created uh, Parity Wallet, Polkadot. And so at the time, the Ethereum price had just gone from $2 to $4. This is like the, the first week of when Ethereum had its run up from a buck to two to four to six. This was all over the course of a couple of weeks. And uh, I'm talking with Gavin and, uh, and I make the decision that, hey, the price is running up. I should go corner the market on GPUs. And so I'm like, I wonder how many GPUs are in the world to corner the market on everything. <laughs> so the next day, research, research, research on my trip to uh, 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 India to see Brendan. And it turns out it only cost $4 million to corner the market on all the high-end AMD GPUs on earth. So that means buying out Newegg, buying out Amazon, buying out the entire retail channel. But also there's three wholesalers out of Hong Kong. that are all the wholesalers of AMD chips. They're the ones that package it into the consumer products you know and contacted the wholesalers and bought out 100% of their inventory. And so we cornered the market on all of the high-end AMD GPUs as Ethereum went from two to four to $8. And so then I get to India, I'm like, Brendan, you wanna corner the market on Ethereum mining with me? <laughs> well, what, what, and I don't remember wh whether he put in a quarter million bucks or a million dollars, but Brendan became one of my main partners in cornering the market on GPUs, which is what 
probably is why block one and EOS exists in part, mm -hmm. because, you know, that was the thing that where, you know, Brendan wanted to get into the business, but then got busy. Brendan wanted to get into the business, but then got busy. Once you've invested a million dollars into coring the market on Ethereum mining, you know, it's going to stay in your mind share. You're not going to get busy and forget about it. That was the, the hook that kind of like really pulled him into the business full force. Wow, that's that's fascinating. What, when when I, 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 that's again another. These are stories I've told almost no one. <laughs> when did you actually buy out the supply of GPUs? Because I remember getting slammed by paying like double MSRP for our inventory of GPUs. Uh, whenever Ethereum went here, I'll I'll look up the dates. I think it was in the. I want to say it was like February, but let me check on a calendar because it's been so long. Uh. Let's go back in time and look at Ethereum prices, and I can tell you exactly when. All right. Yeah, so the price of Ethereum in January 2016 was a buck. And by February, it got to two bucks. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, three, four bucks. Yeah, so it was late January, early February. Gotcha. And no, uh, no love for the NVIDIA GPUs or just that they were just inferior to AMD for mining Ethereum? They were inferior to mining Ethereum at the time. So we cornered the market on just the, the very best stuff. It actually pissed off a lot of gamers that were in, because no one knew who did it. But if you went into the message boards and the forums, you know, people are like, why can't I get the, the, the miners are, so, the, the, the uh, graphic cards are sold out and there's like a six month backlog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was only four million dollars. I didn't know if it was going to cost forty million, you know, or whatever, you know, what it would cost. But it was four million dollars to corner the market on everything. I think it's a little bit ironic that a gamer kind of pwned all these other gamers by buying out all the GPUs. You know, I mean, that, that that's kind of you know, I'm a gamer. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you give me at least like a laundry list of all the different? ventures and businesses you've been involved in in terms of crypto? I mean, I've already done my research, but just for the people who are going to listen to this. I'll, you know, I, this it feels uncomfortable because I don't like to boast. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll just try and touch a couple of high points. Sure. You know, the list is too long to kind of touch on all of them. Mm -hmm. You know, the stuff I'm talking about now is not typically known by most people because it's not that relevant. It's not the the most interesting things I've done. I've done much more interesting things, which is why these typically don't even go on the list. But I um, was a co-founder of MasterCoin. We created the first ever ICO. So uh, we pioneered the market for ICOs. We also created the first meta layer that sat on top of Bitcoin so you could build other apps on Bitcoin, call it the DAP layer. You know, this is where the whole DAP sort of concept came from and building tokens on top of tokens. You know, none of this had been done before. Um, Co-founded Blockchain Capital, which was the first venture fund uh, ever in the space that was dedicated exclusively to crypto and blockchain. Um, Co-founded Tether, which um, does a trillion or two trillion dollars a year. We pioneered the market for stable coins. This is the first time anyone put a real world asset on a blockchain successfully and it, you know, it worked. Um, uh, was trying to buy, you know, bought Mt. Gox back in the day to try and save it in 2014. Uh, that didn't work out as planned back then, but ended up starting the first ever crypto bank in 2014 that spun out of that activity called Noble Bank in Puerto Rico, which was the main crypto bank in the world for a while. Um, uh, created the first ever security token uh, with BCAP in the spring of 2017. I uh, co-founded Block One EOS, the biggest sort of ICO. Um, was a, one of the largest seed investors in the Ethereum crowd sale, put in 500 Bitcoin for a million ETH. Um, dozens of other things. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's, it's a long list, I know. I'm chair, chairman of the Bitcoin Foundation, started the EOS Alliance most recently. Um, uh, just started an EOS proxy, which is Brock Pierce One. Um, and, you know, this week, my time has been almost entirely devoted to, uh, you know, Mt. Gox, mm -hmm. um, trying to make sure that the 24,000 victims or creditors get their money as soon as possible. All of the cash, all of the coin. 
and make sure that nobody tries to, that no one succeeds in getting any of that money. CoinLab is suing the Mt. Gox estate for $16 billion and they want to take all the money and they want to see the victims and the creditors at Mt. Gox to get zero. Um, I arguably own 100% of Mt. Gox. And so I, you know, hopefully can have an influence or a say in what happens. And that is that the victims get everything. It looks like the, the bank's bankruptcy trustee said that the shareholder gets whatever the surplus is, and that's about seven or $800 million. So I arguably could say that seven or $800 million goes to me, but uh, I'd rather see the right thing happen and have all of it go to creditors. Yeah, why don't we dig into that? Because I think that's gonna, that's kind of your main initiative right now is, uh, what is it, the Mount Gox revival? Yeah, well, I mean, I always got lots of things going on. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. so what, what uh, I, I, I don't have idle hands. <laughs> yes. So what would you like to know? Well, first off, why, why don't you give um, people watching this kind of a background of what Mount Gox is and what led to really its collapse in 2014? Yeah, well, I'll go all the way back. So okay. Mount Gox was founded in 2007, before Bitcoin, because Mount Gox stands for Magic, the Gathering, Online, Exchange. What a coincidence. Uh, well, it, was, it came from my old business. And uh, it pivoted to Bitcoin in 2010. And it was sold to Mark Carpellis by Jed McCaleb. So the creator of Mt. Gox was Jed McCaleb, who then went on to found Ripple. And then he founded Stellar. You know, so Jed you know, has gone on to do very big things, starting with Magic, the Gathering cards. <laughs> Um, wonderful guy. And uh, Mark Carpellis bought it, I think, for $50,000. It wasn't even a company. It was, you know, just a project. And uh, it took off in a big way. I mean, Mt. Gox became the most important uh, business in crypto over 2010, 11, 12, 13. You know, Mt. Gox was the main exchange in the world where everybody was buying Bitcoin early on around the world, more so than anywhere else by far. Um, but there were troubles at Mt. Gox. And so in 2014, um, what was supposed to be, you know, call it a million Bitcoin, uh, you know, on deposit or in custody at Mt. Gox, one day they realize it's all gone, that everything's been stolen and there is zero Bitcoin left. And so Mt. Gox collapses. So that's kind of the, the old story of what happened. I got involved in 2012 in 2013. So I ran the biggest um, exchanges in the world for game currencies. So in South Korea, for example, I owned the main two, I was the chairman and the owner of the two main brands uh, that people use to buy and sell game currencies in Korea. And South Korea is the mecca of the online game business. And those businesses were called Item Mania and Item Bay. Uh, the Item Mania team, we founded uh, BitThumb. And so we created the main exchange in Korea. So that's uh, my old team uh, from Itamania. And, uh, and so uh, in 2012-13, in South Korea, we were doing over a billion dollars a year in game currency trading. We had 40% of the population of South Korea as our customers. We were like Facebook. In the state that we were in, we were the largest taxpayer. We were the equivalent of Microsoft. <laughs> and so once you have over 90% market share you know, in a market, uh, you can't really, where do you grow from there? <laughs> you, you own the whole market basically. And so what happens is your company gets valued based upon its growth. And so if you don't have a lot of growth left, the valuation of your company goes down, even though your business's revenues are going up, your profits are going up, but the value of your business is in decline because your growth rate isn't growing rapidly anymore, it's slowing. And so if I had sold the business two years earlier, I would have gotten double what I would get that day for a business that was, you know, 50% bigger. These are just weird dynamics of how businesses are valued. And so I'm going, what do I do? What do I do? How do I grow the business? Well, you know, when you already own kind of the whole market, you have to look at expanding into other markets. And so in 2007 and eight, I almost bought points.com, which is the main marketplace for frequent flyer miles. They're partnered with all the airlines and things of that nature. So I was looking at other digital currencies, you know, loyalty points and things. But uh, 
in 2012, I'm like, oh, Bitcoin's getting big enough that I should probably get into that business. So I went to my board and said, I'd like to buy Mt. Gox. You know, they're the main exchange. My main investor in that company was Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs principal strategies, which was the group within Goldman that was responsible for 40% of all of Goldman Sachs's profits. This was the black box of Goldman where all of the smartest people in Goldman worked. I mean, they were almost half of the company's profits and it was just a tiny little team because it's where all the wizards resided. And so they had never made a private investment before. I was the first ever private investment made by the black box of Goldman. And that's because they came and looked at my business and they said, World of Warcraft has 3,000 plus servers and the gold on every server can't be transferred from one server to another. And the price of gold on every server is different because the supply is different and the items and the accounts. How many games do you manage? How many markets? How many countries? How many languages? How many payment systems? And when they started to look at what I was doing with virtual currencies, they said, you manage a business that's more complex than the global financial system. It just, it's much smaller. Who are you? What is this? How in the world are you managing 10,000 markets and this and that and inventorying? And they're just like, we don't get it, but we have to invest in you because this is the future. This is probably where the world goes. And so I became this very unusual secret investment within Goldman Sachs to wow. try and understand how digital currencies were going to affect the world. So Goldman was my main investor and on the board. And so I'm like, okay, I want to buy Mt. Gox. My board did not have a, a, a positive you know, impression at first. They're like, Bitcoin? Isn't that only used for drugs? Isn't that only used for money laundering? Isn't that only used for like, you know, bad things? And I'm Is like, no. Board at IGE to clarify? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So a digital currency board is skeptical about digital currency. Yeah, well, this one had a weird reputation, you know. Games didn't, World of Warcraft didn't have the same reputation as, you know, Bitcoin. Remember in 2012 and 13, there's only two ways anyone had ever heard of Bitcoin. It was primarily the Silk Road. You know, if you're, if you're the public, right, where, where was Bitcoin mentioned in the news? It was only mentioned as a tool for money laundering, for buying drugs. It basically, the press had basically said Bitcoin only had illegal use cases. Mm. And so unless you had done real research, which most people don't, right? They live off of the sensational headlines of journalists. That was the first impression people had, and understandably so, because that's how the media portrayed it, rightly or wrongly. You know, the media is there to sell clicks and scare people, and you know, generally sell negativity. And so, Ford's first reaction wasn't very positive. I said, "All right, well, let me get you a bunch of research. I'm going to get you all the reasons why I think Bitcoin's going to be a big deal and why I think we should be in that business." And they're like, okay, all right. And so I produced all this research, sent all this information over, you know, come back and have my next board meeting. And uh, the board's like, nah, we, we still don't get it. And I'm like, did any of you read the materials I sent? And, you know, they're kind of evading the question. And I'm like, none of you guys even read any of this stuff. You know, you guys call me the godfather of digital currency but you don't bother to listen to me or read the things I send you when I say it's important. And so it was kind of an unpleasant call. Afterwards, I called up my partner's partner, Brad Stevens. This is now in, uh, we're now into 2013. And uh, I said, guys, because Brad Stevens was on the board of, uh, my old, of IGE. And they ran the biggest hedge fund in the world investing in uh, public game companies. And they were hardcore gamers and they were my customers. That's how they became investors. They didn't know me. They started buying from IGE in 2003 and 2004. And they're like, oh my God, this is a big business. If we're spending you know, a couple hundred dollars a month and Blizzard's only getting $15 a month, I don't think anyone is aware of this, but this is a big business that no one's ever heard of. And they're like, we need to figure out this. We're the first people in the world to figure this out. We're going to be the first guys to invest in it. And so they go look up the top 10 companies buying and selling game currencies. And they're like, okay, we figured out who the top 10 are. Awesome. Who owns them? And they went into domain registry and started doing who is research. And they realized I owned all of them. <laughs> they're like, who is this guy Brock that already rolled up an entire industry before anyone heard of it? <laughs> um, and they're like, okay, we need to get a hold of him. So that's how I ended up in business with Bart and Brad Stevens, who are my co-founders of blockchain capital. 
And so they're on the board. And I call them up after this board meeting. I'm like, hey, guys, I'm really disappointed in you. You guys understand this. You're gamers, you're users, you're, you know, of anyone on the board that should get why this Mount Gox deal makes sense, it's you. And why I'm disappointed is not that you disagree with me. It's that you didn't read any of the materials I sent you. You didn't do any research. You disagreed with me without having an opinion. If you had actually done the work to read the things and had an informed opinion and you disagreed with me, I would understand that. But you're disagreeing with me without having done the work. And this is in front of our board when you're supposed to be the experts. You know, this is not cool. And I gave them such a hard time that they went on to do a three month research project to dig deep into what is Bitcoin, talking to cryptographers, talking to mathematicians, talking to economists. And after that project, we started blockchain capital and they shut down their hedge fund to do this full time. So, I mean, it, it did work out. It was just, you know, three to six months delayed. But uh, in the end, um, we didn't buy Mt. Gox through that business, you know, Goldman and others. It was reputationally just too risky. And so then I asked my board, can I go buy it personally? And they're like, hey, you've given the company the opportunity first. That's your job as chairman. Um, uh, so, yeah, the board gives you permission to pursue it personally. So then I started working on buying the company myself and I tried to imitate the coin lab deal. So coin lab had done a deal in the United States to run Mount Gox as a joint venture partner in North, uh, in North America, meaning Canada and the U S I said, well, Bitcoin isn't used in China yet. No one in China has ever heard of Bitcoin and I have 400,000 suppliers. And I mean, all my old industry is like the whole digital currency market in China. So I said to Mark Carpellis and I, I, I used to carry Chinese government cards. Uh, my CEO was, uh, was the colonel in the uh, People's Liberation Army that laid all the fiber optic cable to build the internet in all of China. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm what in, in China, what you'd call someone that has Guan Chi, uh, meaning very connected. And, um, you know, I built television channels in China, started the first television channel in China, which was a joint venture by a foreigner, a joint venture with Shanghai Media Group. You know, all my friends were generals in the PLA and you know, things of that nature. Actually, if you were in prison in China, uh, you had to play World of Warcraft to mine currency for us. Wow. I mean, yeah. If you were any good. Because if you were in prison in China, you had to work. But you would normally be like doing textiles and making shoes, you know, and sewing and losing fingers. But if you were a good gamer, you could make more money in prison than you could doing all the other jobs. And so that if you were in prison, your goal was to be the guy that got to play games all day. That was like the dream come true as, a, as someone in prison in China. But a good, you know, a good gamer in prison made more money than, you know, any other worker in prison. Wow, that's, that's hard to believe. I, I, I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. <laughs> and so I, I explained to Mark, let me, let me bring Mt. Gox to China. So I went and bought Mt. Gox.cn. I assembled a management team, lined up the capital, all of the things, because Bitcoin wasn't in Asia yet. I mean, not really. And I said, I could be the one that will introduce China to Bitcoin in a meaningful way. And so uh, we started doing all that, setting everything up. I brought on uh, an old partner of mine, Malcolm Cassell, to be CEO. Malcolm was the co-founder of PCCW, which is like, a, I think it's worth $40 billion today. It's the main telecom in Asia, one of the main telcos with uh, Lee Kai-shing's son, Richard Lee, who's the wealthiest man in Hong Kong that also owns Canada. And um, uh, he, at the time that we started hanging out, was the CEO of Groupon China. And so I hired him away from Groupon to become the CEO of Xfire, which was a gaming messaging system that I bought from Viacom that owns MTV. And so I was running the main gaming messaging system for a little while. And... Um, and so I brought Malcolm in. I'm like, hey, you should be CEO of this. Let's go. Mt. Gox, China. And then we decided not to do the deal in the end because we had concerns about the infrastructure at Mt. Gox and the management at Mt. Gox. We're like, as the joint venture partner, we're basically the sales arm that's bringing it to market. But if there's something that happens in Japan, that affects us. If there's a hack in the Japanese group, our business goes under. If something happens at the parent, something happens to us. So we negotiated a deal to launch China, and then we had the option to buy the parent because I didn't have the, the cash to pay $100 million to buy Mt. Gox at the time my company did. 
but I didn't. Now it became a personal deal. I didn't, you know, I didn't have the ability to buy Mt. Gox. I wasn't sitting on 100 or 200 million dollars in early 2013 that I could go buy Mt. Gox with. Um, and so uh, we decided not to do the deal in the end because we had too many concerns about the uh, infrastructure and management. Um, wow, we dodged a bullet. <laughs> Talk about good intuition. <laughs> um, but um, uh, fast forward, Mt. Gox collapses in early 2014. I was giving a talk in San Francisco that day. I think the first ever Bitcoin talk at the launch event. So Jason Kalkanis started TechCrunch Disrupt and then he started launch. And so I was giving, I think, the first Bitcoin talk ever at launch. I come off the stage and my phone's blowing up. Gox, 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 Gox. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> uh, all right. And so I gave Mark Carpellis a call from the event. I said, hey, Mark, um, I'm interested in buying Mt. Gox. He said, are you watching the news? I said, yeah, that's why I'm calling. And he goes, and you're still interested? I said, I am. The terms have obviously changed. Um, but let me call you back. I'm going to go to the airport, jump on a plane, and I'll call you tonight uh, with a proposal. And so later that night, I uh, called him up and I said, all right, Mark, uh, you're going to sell the business to me for a dollar. Normally, you'd have to pay someone tens of millions of dollars to take over a business like this because it's worth a lot less than zero and there's probably no upside. <laughs> <laughs> but I care about the industry. And what's happened here is going to set Bitcoin back a year or two. This is going to really, really, really hurt the overall ecosystem. This is going to damage the reputation of Bitcoin, Bitcoin globally. This is our Enron. This is our Bernie Madoff. This is our Lehman Brothers. This is our Bear Stearns. And this is the last thing in the world I want to do. Because <laughs> there's probably no upside, but someone's got to do it. So you're going to sell me the business for a dollar. Because you're going to let the big boys come in and clean up your mess and hopefully keep you out of jail. He's like, yes, please. <laughs> Please, please, please. I changed the terms from $1 to one Bitcoin. I thought that was more appropriate. And at the time, that was a 460 times increase in the purchase price from what I originally offered. How generous. Yeah, <laughs> at least on that basis. <laughs> um, and then uh, did a deal to buy out Jed McCaleb's 12%. And then... Uh, Started working hard at like figuring out how to salvage the reputation of Bitcoin or at least do the best we could. We went and signed a contract with NASDAQ. And so when we were going to relaunch Mt. Gox, it was going to say Mt. Gox powered by NASDAQ. You know, what are all the things you had to do to lend credibility to try and turn the story around, right? How do you take a wrong and turn it into a right? And uh, then two class action lawsuits were filed on behalf of the 103,000 account holders. Uh, we went and settled both class action lawsuits in the U.S. We drafted uh, the original CR plan or civil rehabilitation plan because we were saying, let's rehabilitate the business, not liquidate. Rehabilitate, don't liquidate. And we were doing all these chants and like, you know, you had to be around back then to really understand how big a deal this was. I mean, this was one of the biggest news stories on the planet. I mean, this was as big as Lehman Brothers collapsing. This is how most people on earth learned about Bitcoin for the first time. This was the story that introduced the world to Bitcoin. Well, not only were you, was it like Lehman Brothers, but you were actually the government that came in and bailed them out. Trying to. Trying. Yeah. Well, because that's, that's, that, our industry is about that. We're not like Lehman Brothers. This is what I keep saying. In the old financial world, because people are only motivated by personal incentives, right? What's good for them. You know, only the government can help. Our industry, I like to argue, is different. We're a community of people building open source systems with open minds and open hearts, trying to make the world a better place. And I felt that it was very important to demonstrate to the world that we are different. And I thought this was one of the best ways to do it. And so eventually, though, we lost that battle and the bankruptcy courts in Japan decided to go through a liquidation proceeding instead of a rehabilitation proceeding. And so I, you know, blue, I don't know if it was a million dollars or something on lawyers and whatnot. And it was getting, you know, very expensive. You know, I've been blessed with some success in my life, but that's a lot of money. Um, and so uh, we started slowing down and we took 
that business that we were building to relaunch the um, uh, Mount Gox Exchange. And uh, because we felt what we were doing at the time was noble, we felt that we were, you know, trying to be white knights kind of thing. We created a company called Noble Markets, which became Noble Bank. Hmm. So it, something did come out of it. We created the first ever crypto bank instead. <laughs> um, but um, we went and hacked the banking system through Puerto Rico. And so then fast forward, you know, uh, then obviously in the mix, talking constantly to, you know, people and trying to understand what's going to happen. But once something goes into bankruptcy, a liquidation, and in Japan, this takes three, four, five, 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. so obviously, you're not going to work on that full time. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, you know, been kind of like trying to stay on top of stuff. And then the bankruptcy trustee announced in late 2017, because the price of Bitcoin had gone up, that any surplus in assets, because the creditors were only entitled to about $400 million. Uh, when it went under, creditors were entitled to their losses at $425 per Bitcoin. But then the price of Bitcoin skyrocketed. And so the bankruptcy trustee said the shareholder gets all the surplus, which at the time was billions. And so then that became a very important thing. Uh, I didn't think that um, creditors should be, you know, not given all the money. They shouldn't, creditors shouldn't be limited to $425 of Bitcoin. You know, they were early investors in Bitcoin. They took big risk. And just because the way that the financial system has to mark to market and because Bitcoin was worth $425 at the time and the bankruptcy trustee had to say, I have to list who's owed what and we can't list Bitcoin. I have to determine what is the amount of their liability. He priced it at 425. And that didn't seem right. And so uh, fortunately, the uh, courts have now initiated a process to take it out of a bankruptcy liquidation and potentially into a rehabilitation, which means the liability can be repriced. And so hopefully, the creditors get 100% of the money and the Bitcoin that's left. There's about 1.2 to $1.3 billion. Now, contractually, arguably, I'm owed that seven or 800 million as the person that bought Mt. Gox back in 2014. I don't want one cent. I don't want any of it. I want creditors to get everything. And so this is one of the reasons why I'm very actively involved right now is because I have an influence over what happens. And I want to make sure the right thing happens. I wanna make sure that the victims, the 24,000 creditors that have filed claims with the bankruptcy courts, get it all. I also wanna make sure that CoinLab, so I don't know if you know the story of CoinLab, but CoinLab formed this partnership to try and run Mt. Gox in the US and Canada. And they were gonna get 90% of the Mt. Gox revenues in these markets, which is a big percentage, 90%. Mount Gox, you have the brand and everything and all the tech and everything, and you're only getting 10%, what? The reason why is CoinLab had to argue that operating in the US and Canada for legal reasons is really, really hard. You need money transmitter licenses and there's all these regulations and it's really, really complicated. And therefore, because CoinLab is gonna do all that work to be compliant and run that business, they deserve 90% of the revenue, not half or 10%, right? So CoinLab does a deal promising that they're going to be able to run this compliantly and in a timely fashion, and CoinLab does nothing. CoinLab doesn't do any of the things they committed to. They're in complete breach of contract, completely failed to do everything they were supposed to do. And so Mt. Gox has no choice at this point but to cancel the contract for breach. So Mt. Gox cancels the CoinLab contract. CoinLab then embezzles the $5 million of Mt. Gox customer funds they were holding. They steal all the money. Mt. Cox then goes bank, you know, has its bankruptcy proceedings in early 2014. And CoinLab then sues the Mt. Cox estate saying, you owe us $70 million for canceling the contract that they breached. And after they stole, embezzled $5 million of customer money. I mean, are you kidding me? You did absolutely nothing. You stole money. You failed to deliver on all your commitments. And now you're suing? It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. 
but it gets even crazier. They just updated their lawsuit, and now they're claiming in Japan that Mt. Gox owes them $16 billion. They're saying creditors deserve nothing. Wow. CoinLab is saying they deserve 100% of all the money and all the coins, and they want to see all the victims get zero. This is another reason why I'm getting involved. I won't let that happen. And that this is going to clearly be a fight. Is it just heating up? Was this recent? It's been going on for a little while, but the creditors are not really paying attention, so they don't really know what's going on. Because it's been five years. Yeah. You know, you feel fatigue. You get tired. It's hard to stay on top of things. And then everyone's like, well, let me let someone else, you know, someone else is looking after it. And there's the assumption that everybody else is doing the work and everyone else is doing the research. And there are some great people like Andy Pagg. You know, uh, he works for the BBC. He's a lawyer, investigative journalist, you know, um, out of Ireland. He's mm -hmm. doing incredible work, you know, on behalf of creditors. He set up Mt. Gox Legal, which is a pooling of funds because, you know, mo most people, all their money's locked up in bankruptcy. You know, the people that were Mt. Gox customers don't have their money. They made a really smart early investment in Bitcoin, but they've not benefited at all yet. And by the way, that $70 million lawsuit from CoinLab is the reason it's taking so long. Everyone might already have their money if it wasn't for CoinLab, if it wasn't for the villains. You know, the guys trying to steal everything. And so we're going to see a lot of work to do here. <laughs> you know, but my, my, my view is, and you know, uh, I want to see the victims get everything that they can. Right? I want to see them made whole if possible. So get them everything that's there. Try and go after the missing coins. There's still 650,000 missing Bitcoin. And go after the bad guys, like CoinLab. You know, I don't think CoinLab has any money, but you know, hopefully the Mt. Gox victims get all of it, if they have anything. <laughs> Normally, I'm not a person that would say stuff like that, but these guys are bad guys, very bad guys. And so um, I hope the creditors sue them for the damage they're doing, the interference they're running. But uh, obviously there's a recovery act effort to go collect what else can be found. And then I also think we should relaunch the exchange. Remember when Bitfinex got hacked, what did they do? They basically gave creditors profits from the exchange. If Mt. Gox had been live the last five years, powered by NASDAQ, if what we, the original CR plan that we proposed had worked, everybody might be whole already. So let's get that exchange launched and let's give every creditor ownership in the exchange that wants it. You know, between the combination of these things, hopefully we can get everyone their money back. And so I like to think about this as a story. I'm a storyteller. The story of Mt. Gox is not over yet. It's like Game of Thrones. We just haven't seen the last season, right? Or read the last book. But we, as an industry, have the power to write the ending of this story. How do we want it to end? Do we want it to end with in flames and victims losing their lives, their houses, their spouses, and you know, having suffered for having bet early on Bitcoin? Or do we want to see a happy ending where the victims get made whole, the exchange like a phoenix rises from the ashes, and we change the perception of Bitcoin globally, how we're perceived as an industry. We have that opportunity. Um, and I'm a fan of Joseph Campbell, so I always like a good hero's journey. We clearly have some villains. Well, that segues into one of my next questions is, as the owner of Mount Gox, are you um, at least have suspicious about what happened to the 650,000 Bitcoin? Because there's allegations about an insider job, it's a hack, there's all these other speculation about what happened and it's not really clear what really was the cause or where, where it happened or even when it happened. Yeah, so we have a lot of that information and if you go to goxrising.com and pay attention over the next couple months, we'll be releasing everything. Gotcha. We've been working on this for years. Excellent, that's really good to hear. So is, this whole idea of making these um, these predators whole. I don't know if you're, you yourself are a creditor if you used Mount Cox back in the day, but. No, I, 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 I was not a creditor because I was almost launching Mount Cox China and didn't. 
therefore I didn't keep any Bitcoin at Mt. Gox. Gotcha. So, so you kind of saw the, the foreshadowing. I, I mean, I didn't know. I had an intuition that's, you know, I, uh, you know, had I, had I known what I know now, obviously I would have been a whistleblower and I would have, you know, told everyone, get your money out. But, um, I didn't know. And you can't, unless you know what you're talking about, you can't attack people, right? It's not my place to go say, you know, get your money out of Mt. Cox when I don't have any data, no empirical data that says that there's something actually wrong. You know, I just didn't feel comfortable. Something didn't look right. But just because something doesn't feel right, doesn't give me the right to go, you know, vilify, you know, that business. Um, I wish I had known more. So what, so what possessed you to do this is mostly just on behalf of the creditors because you care about the industry, just to clarify, and you want I mean, to- Yeah, I've been doing it. I, I started this five years ago. I have a habit of finishing those things that I start. Gotcha. Well, and, and most importantly, I want to make sure that that surplus of seven or $800 million ends up in the right hands. Mm -hmm. The bankruptcy trustee said it was going to go to the shareholder. And no one, even though you can go Google everything and see that I, you know, arguably bought the business, everyone thought that Mark Carpellis was going to get all the money. Oh. You know, and Mark Carpellis is in bankruptcy and Tabane is in bankruptcy. So even if Mark wants the creditors to get all the money, it's not his decision. It's the bankruptcy trustee of Tabane that makes that decision. And most bankruptcy trustees are not going to say, give the money to creditors when their job is to represent the Tabain entity. So okay. Tabain is going to, I would imagine, make the argument that all the surplus goes to them. It, it's not Mark's decision. It's a bankruptcy trustee's decision. So does the 700 go to the bankruptcy trustee or does it go to you, that 700 million? Tabain is a different company. Okay. So Tabain owned 88% of the equity. I bought the 88% from Tabane. Now, it's unclear, which is why I keep using the word arguably, whether I own the 88% or whether Tabane owns the 88%. Tabane is Mark's company. And so Tabane, like Mt. Gox, is in bankruptcy. Tabane is also in bankruptcy. So Mark doesn't control Tabane. It's controlled by a bankruptcy trustee. I see. And that bankruptcy trustee's job is to get as much money for Tabane as possible. That's his job. And so it's very important that Tabane doesn't own it. I see. Otherwise, creditors may not get it. So if the 700 does go to you, though, you could just redistribute it to the original holders. Yeah, I, I, that shouldn't have to go that way. Okay. If, as the, if you're the shareholder and you're saying, as part of a CR plan, I want it all to go here, you know, it, it shouldn't have to do that. I don't want it. I don't want to ever touch it. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Please don't ever have that money touch my hands. <laughs> that sounds like a hassle. Yes. So you, you also mentioned about Noble Bank. I, I also read a while back that you were doing some sort of large charitable effort, a billion dollar charitable effort in Puerto Rico. Why, well, why not, not that? specific to Puerto Rico. I, I committed to giving away a billion dollars. Yes. <laughs> uh, why do you talk about that? That's a pretty big clue. So 700 million here and a billion there, so 1.7 billion. Well, actually, this 700 million, I arguably, I think I can knock it off my billion. <laughs> <laughs> so I, might, I might be, I might only be two or three hundred million dollars in the hole. Um, but uh, I mean, I don't. I live my life in service. I believe in trying to make the world a better place. I always talk about that a billionaire is not someone with a billion dollars, but someone that's positively impacting the lives of a billion people. And I believe that people learn best through inspiration, you know, through action. And so I'm just trying to do big, bold things to inspire others to do big, bold things to make the world a better place because we need it. That's all. You know, it's crazy, you know, but as I think Steve Jobs would say, the crazy ones are the ones that change the world. Yeah. So why don't you go into detail about this crazy plan? Because on surface level, it's just like, oh, he's giving away a billion dollars. But what are the actual nuances to that? Um, well, it, it, the nuances are, it's a lot harder than I thought <laughs> to, to do that with high efficacy, right? Mm -hmm. Give your money to the Red Cross, it'll all be gone, you know, and not actually help anyone. <laughs> I mean, it'll help some people. Like, look at Haiti. I think the Red Cross took in all that money and they built a total of six houses. 
all of it basically went to funding overhead and private planes and things of that nature, right? Um, and so giving money away thoughtfully is very difficult. The, the macro of where I'm trying to go is ultimately trying to create uh, a charity DAO. Ultimately, I want to create a system where people can give money to a decentralized system with decentralized governance to start solving the world's biggest problems. One area I'm focused on, and if anyone listens to this and wants to help, I need help. I don't have all the answers. I'm trying to figure this out. No one's ever done it before. I've done a lot of things that no one's ever done before, and every time it's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> but I, but I, I need help. I'm spread, spread, uh, stretched uh, and spread thin between Puerto Rico and everything else. But um, I want to help the Amazon, for example. Um, I've been donating money to Amazon Watch lately. You know, that rainforest is very, 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 very important. Um, and also want to protect the indigenous people that live there. And part of the reason I'm in Puerto Rico, and, and we're going to have to wrap up here in a moment because I'm running out of time now. Yes. But uh, uh, when Christopher Columbus sailed across the Atlantic in 1492, he first set up shop in Puerto Rico in early 1493. That became the headquarters of the New World. All of Europe's influence on North and South America and the Caribbean started basically in Puerto Rico. That is ground zero. All of Europe's influence on the indigenous people throughout all of the Americas began in Puerto Rico, beginning with the Tainos. And so Puerto Rico is one of my main focuses. The Amazon, you know, is uh, another major focus. And just trying to figure out how to make the world a better place. And, you know, if people have big ideas on how to do that, want to do things built on DAO or DAX, I am, you know, looking for help. Is, is that the thread behind all your ventures with all these investments in different, in crypto and gaming and all these other different enterprises? Is that the thread behind why you're doing all of this? Well, it is now. I mean, I, I can't say that my, my uh, view of why I do things or what my motivations are were always so altruistic. You know, when I was younger, I was definitely more greedy, more capitalistic, more fighting for me. I've always been nice and generous and things, but, um, you know, as I get older, I become more and more altruistic. But also I've had more and more success, right? And when you become blessed with substantial abundance and substantial success, you know, responsibility comes with it. And what do you do with that responsibility? I'm choosing to do as much as I can. You know, some people just choose to have a good time. I choose to double down and work even harder and give even more away and try to make the world a better place. Well, seeing as you're under time constraints, I feel like that's an excellent place to leave it off of. Um, thank you for tuning in with Cryptosly. You're here with Brock Pierce, and we look forward to uh, talking again soon, Brock. Thank you.